Hill. Um, we'll be having a proclamation for the winner of the City of Burlington 7th grade essay contest. If I were mayor, that ought to be awesome. Uh, jump to number three. Uh, public hearing, consideration of lease agreement between the City of Burlington and Burlington Community School District for use of Saunderson Park at 1310 Valley Street, Burlington, Iowa. Mr. Tisler. Uh, yes, again, this is a lease agreement uh, with the school district who owns the property where Saunderson Park is located, uh, just to the northwest of Apollo School Site. Uh, we were previously under a 20-year lease um, dating back to 1997, uh, acquired with them about uh, renewing that lease, and uh, they'd like to have another 20-year lease uh, similar to what was there before. Um, just some minor updates to the language in the lease from previous, um, but uh, essentially it's a, a city park operated and maintained by the city of Burlington during this time. Um, we have good use of, uh, I guess it's a appreciated park in that neighborhood and something we wish to continue. Council? Okay. Has there ever been any uh, consideration of purchasing the property? For I inquired to that. They'd prefer to maintain a 20 year lease at this time, but mm -hmm. it was inquired whether they'd like to sell that at the. Okay. Thanks. We're good. Okay. All right. Number four motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance rezoning outlot of three of Swisher subdivisions from R1, single family residential, to R2, single family residential, transitional district. Mr. Tisler. This again being the property located on the south side of West Avenue, uh, east of Willow Street, uh, approximately eight and a half acres, uh, recently subdivided into the Swisher subdivision. Uh, this is uh, being proposed by Dan Kale for a new residential subdivision and uh, wants flexibility to allow some duplex condominiums on the property as well. So this would allow single family and or duplex on the on the site. Council. Is that waivable in other people's minds? That's waivable so to good. me. Yes. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. All right. Is that okay, Mr. Fern? Okay. We waiving number four. <clears throat> Everybody else is good? Moving right along. Number five, motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance amending section B, land use design criteria of ordinance number 3104 for the Burlington Senior Living Campus, PUD. Mr. Tisdall. This is the Rosebush Gardens Assisted Living Facility on West Avenue, just to the east of Gear. Uh, they had a PUD and adopted in 1998 when this was uh, first developed. And that PUD uh, specified a 175-foot front yard setback from West Avenue property line. Uh, that was agreed to between the developer and the city. Uh, they would like to uh, explore an addition on the north side of their existing building that would go into that uh, front yard setback and would like to reduce that to 30 feet, which is our typical uh, zoning code setback for R1 areas. Uh, so this would fall in line with our existing zoning code and allow them to do an uh, addition on the front of their property. Council. Council, why not? Is that waivable? It's good for me. Good for me. Okay. We're good? Good. All right. And we'll be waiving the second reading on that. Number six. Motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance amending section 126.16, financial responsibility of chapter 126 taxi cabs and vehicles for hire of the Burlington Municipal Code. Uh, no, no change. Mayor Pro Tem? Favorable by me. Yes. Yeah. All we're doing is changing it to real estate mm -hmm. law. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's good? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. You guys are fantastic tonight. Number seven. Motion for preliminary adoption of the second reading of an ordinance amending ordinances related to designating an area of Burlington, Iowa as the Burlington Urban Revitalization Area. Mr. Tisla. Uh, this just spells out the legal description to be added uh, as part of the Urban Revitalization Area, which includes the Apollo School site and the property to the north uh, between Jefferson and Market Street, Central and Woodlawn. Okay. 
Council? Sounds good. All right. We're good with waiving that? Yes. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> All right, keep that, keep that hand ready. We may need it again. All right, number eight, a resolution approving the sale of property locally known as 11, 11 I'm sorry, as 1114 Linden Street, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. Mr. Tesla. This is a property we previously sold. Uh, the bidder at the time uh, did pay for the property, but uh, has uh, contacted us and would not like to move forward and would like to transfer uh, to the second uh, bidder on the property. Um, since it's still a city property, um, I guess talking to our attorney, we can go through the resolution of sale and sell at the second highest uh, uh, bid price, which was $500 to the neighbor. Uh, we already had the public hearing on it, and everyone was <coughs> notified of it, and this would just go to the second highest bidder, mm -hmm. uh, which again is the neighbor to the west uh, adjacent to the property for $500. This again is a vacant piece of land with a, a garage on the site. Did we refund the money to the okay. council? Moving okay. right along. Okay. Moving right along then. Uh, now to the uh, consent agenda. First is a resolution approving nuisance abatements for various properties. Anybody have a problem? That was a long list. But I'll tell you. Okay. Um, number two is a resolution approving final acceptance and release of retention monies for the 2017 West Avenue and West Burlington Avenue roundabout rise project, number RM0977643-9D-29. Mr. McGregor. Uh, in front of you is a resolution approving the final payment and then the uh, acceptance of it and then the release of retention in 30 days. Um, the retention is $47,796.98. Um, as you can see in the billing, we've actually made um, a final payment through all the draws requests that have been made, bringing the total pr project price to 955,939.56. Um, there are some punch lists type items, uh, making sure that the seating has all taken place out at the roundabout, which it mostly has. Um, the silt fence will be removed at that time. So um, recommend approval. Just for the record, um, I was a little shaky at the beginning. People weren't getting it, but I'm getting a lot of compliments. People say that uh, it's, uh, it's really working out, so um, there's that. And you turn right. Well, you know what? If I knew he was going to start trouble, I'd have had somebody else come down here, but we'll just keep going. Are we Do you good? know, is, are the Silgan uh, uh, semis coming in on West Avenue and going that way, or are they still coming in on Division? From what I've noticed, they come in off Division, and I don't know that they necessarily leave through the roundabout. I've never um, seen them anyway. So. I know that the proposed plan was for them to come off of West Avenue and right. then turn there, and then so they could exit on the Division. Right. Um, I don't know that that traffic pattern has completely changed yet. We're good? Yes. Yes. All right. Number three. Uh, resolution approving final acceptance and release of retention monies for the 2016 Cascade Watershed Sewer Separation Project, Phase 2, Nick Mack. Uh, this resolution approves the final acceptance for the 2016 Cascade Project, which actually ended back in May. Um, due to the completion of the project and the seeding timelines, it said there's a timeline in the spring and then one in the fall. We couldn't final that project out until the seeding happened. That seeding has now taken place. Um, now we can final it out. The total project price for that is four hundred and thirty-two thousand seven hundred seventy-five thousand sixty-seven cents. That's considerably underestimated. Mm -hmm. isn't it? Correct. And, and both of these came in underestimate. Yes, they did, and under under bid too. Yes. That's good because we got some stuff that's going a little over. So uh, maybe it'll maybe it'll wash. We'll give and take. Out. Everybody's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Number four. I always like to hear on the budget. <laughs> I know you do. Number four. A resolution approving an agreement between the City of Burlington, <laughs> Iowa, and Alliant Energy Incorporated for all night lighting service on Arch Street. Nick. So we've had actually, this is one of two back to back street light requests um, here recently. Um, 
and we don't really have a a process I, I guess I would say or a policy to to get them approved other than to just bring them simply to City Council for approval um, what I did here is that I had a staff member give kind of some pictures and layout of what the situation is for cool. each one of them um, and based on that criteria moving forward uh, you know proximity of power lines uh, existing poles to use um, and kind of the lighting conditions of that area that's kind of what I'm going to try and base my recommendation on um, and also let you inform me. Do you want to throw the map up first? That's probably what really matters. These, there's some pictures here. And these come from uh, neighbor requests? Correct. Right. Citizen requests of that area. So the first, I gave you the wrong one. We're, at, <laughs> we're on Arch Street or North 5th. I don't know. We're on Arch. It correlates with these pictures here, which I could show you, but it's much easier to show and, and discuss what that is. Um, one, three, four, five, six, and seven are the current locations of, of lighting in this area. Um, number two is an existing pole, and in, as you see in the request or in the resolution, that is where I am suggesting we put that street light. The request was at 801 North 5th, um, somewhere in the mid-block area. Um, I simply put it on the other side of the road because there is existing infrastructure in that area. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and as far as what it's lit up at night, there are some cities that use a lumen meter to determine kind of a baseline on where they make decisions from based on residential, arterial, collector type streets. That's something we can go to if you would like but not really understanding where, where you guys wanted to go with this. I just um, kind of left that alone. I like where we're at for right now. Okay. But. Yeah, that's good. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know the requester is in the audience tonight, so. The requester's in the audience? Correct. And the, the requester uh, received. Uh, you didn't catch that? No. <laughs> okay. You know what, after the meeting, I'll, I'll tell okay, you what I meant with that. There. I mean, I'll come up with an answer by then. Are you guys good to go? Yeah. Okay. Which brings us to number five. You're going to stay right there, Nick? Correct. All right, good. We have a resolution approving an agreement between the City of Burlington, Iowa, and Alliant Energy Incorporated for all-night lighting service on South 4th Street. Mr. McGregor. Um, the request comes in for the in-between Harrison and Hedge on 4th Street. Uh, there are current lights at one, five, four. Uh, I don't think two in the middle there has it. That's just indicating a light pole. But number three is the location that I put in the resolution. Uh, there's an existing pole there. Um, there are two lines going across it, and I talked to a line, and they said it shouldn't be a problem. So the what tree cost, can't. What cost do we incur? That should have explained that, shouldn't I? It, it will cost us $9.94 a month per light. Um, it is an LED 80 watt light. Um, the installation will not co cost us anything, but moving forward, for instance, if there was no pole or uh, line in that area, uh, that is where I probably would caution you on running, running line down a block and then dropping in a pole. Um, it could run anywhere from three to $5,000 to have them do that. In this case, it will not using existing infrastructure. You guys good? Get her done. Okay, we'll move to number six. We have a resolution to install a stop sign for eastbound westbound traffic at the intersection of South Gertrude Street and William Street. Mr. McGregor. Had a request for a stop sign at the intersection of Gertrude and Williams. Um, I showed, put a map up here to show you the proximity um, where it's at and its relationship to Course School. Uh, on the three things that it, that it warrants a stop sign for, uh, site distance, uh, accident load and then um, man what is it I don't remember it only hit sight distance there was however two accidents or two one severe accident in the last three months there um, it does not have enough traffic load in the area to trip a, a trip a stop sign um, but based on the the severity of the accident and the its approximate distance to the school 
Public Works uh, would be satisfied with installing that. Okay, Council, you guys good with that? So it's okay. It's William Street that's going to stop. Correct, right. East West. Right. And we had a severe accident in the last three months there. Huh? Yeah, a car was rolled actually into somebody's front yard. Somebody put some security camera footage and actually caught that. So it's kind of scary. Um, there's a lot of uncontrolled intersections in the city of Burlington. Um, that makes me nervous always to go through. And <laughs> I don't think you combat that with stop signs all the time. Um, but in this case, given, given how close it is to the school, um, I think that it's appropriate. Uh, that's the kicker for me. I tell you, as a former driver education teacher, yeah. Uncontrolled intersections was one of my lessons, and it was a good lesson for. A, and there was a lot of options in Burlington <laughs> for uncontrolled intersections. Yeah. Satisfied? Yes. So okay. all of you that had me as driver and driver yes. said, uh, <laughs> you remember. Everybody sitting in this room. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. If we're good, we're moving on. Uh, number seven. A resolution approving reimbursement for the Imagine Committee's indoor uh, sports and recreational facilities, property acquisition, and what? That's not reading right. Resolution approving reimbursement for the Imagine Committee's indoor sports and recreation facility property acquisition and facility remodel construction <laughs> effort. Mr. Shin. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's been since uh, January was the last time that we've uh, we stood before the council, so we thought it'd be a good idea to uh, maybe. Uh, just give a really quick update. I know you could you give everybody your name and oh, I'm numbers. sorry. Yeah, I'm Matt Shin. I'm the co-chair of the the Imagine campaign and also the uh, the uh, the uh, the campaign chair uh, for the indoor sports complex. Everybody knew that. I just wanted to have you do that. <laughs> no, anyways. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Um, so we wanted to provide just a, a little bit of update on, on where we've where we've been and, and where we've where we've come to to this point. So, uh, you know, seven years ago we we, we began down this this uh, this this uh, this process uh, which called Imagine, where we engaged the commit uh, the community to come up with some some big ideas to kind of transform um, our community moving forward. There were five big ideas. The one that kind of kept coming to the the forefront after all the 2,500 suggestions that we got through the from the, 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 the community was an indoor sports complex. One, to extend our visitor season, the, the, uh, the success that we see from the outdoor recplex, um, we want to extend um, not only um, during the summertime, but, but all year round. And, um, and also, too, there is a need within our community for additional space, recreational space, gym space. So we thought, is there a way um, that we can come together as a community and, um, and, and share space. So, so since that time, um, when we were with you in January, we were talking about a single facility after, um, that would be located on the southeastern campus. Uh, since that time, there's been a, uh, um, an opportunity for us to, uh, to purchase um, the, uh, the, the, the old Raider precast concrete um, that's located out on Gear Avenue. What you'll see up on the screen right now is a rendering of, of the change of the, the facility that would be located out on southeastern um, the community college campus. So you, what, you, what you're looking at is two full-size um, collegiate basketball courts uh, with some um, other areas and so forth. But, um, and then, Eric, if you hit the next slide. Um, and then this is the, a, a picture of the, um, of the Raider precast concrete um, plant. Um, located out in West Burlington on Gear Avenue. You'll hit the next one, please. Um, and then there it is. We, we were approached probably, um, boy, uh, probably five months ago with the opportunity of purchasing this. Um, what, what this does by going from the one facility to the two facilities, it's taken our project cost from approximately $14 million to approximately $10 million. So really what it does is it, it, it brings this project um, really, um, within grasp of, of us um, having something like this um, within our community. So, um, so we, we've got some renderings. So the, uh, the, the building that'd be located out at the Raider um, plant would actually be called the turf. And that would be where all of our turf sports would be. Um, the other nice thing that this has done, so not only have we reduced the cost of the overall project by $4 million, we've doubled our turf space. 
Um, so using the existing building, using an, uh, an asset that we already had in our community, we've doubled our turf space and reduced the cost by $4 million. You can see that really um, that there's, there's the opportunity uh, to configure this a number of different ways. Um, there you, what we've got up there on the screen would actually show uh, five individual um, um, uh, fields um, of play, batting cages, so forth. Um, there's also been talk of a, of a golf simulator. Um, we could do not only soccer, but, uh, but, but, but football, baseball, any type of turf-related um, activity could be out there. Um, hope, we're hoping all season long. Um, there's just some additional renderings of concession area and so forth. We feel, after engaging um, um, the, um, the folks that travel and, the, and these, these um, like soccer and so forth, that there is no, uh, there's no facility like this uh, within the region. And about seven or six or seven years ago, um, when Dennis Hinkle and, um, and Steve Delaney and Mike Pearson and I, we took a tour of the region. And I will tell you that you have to go to Chicago, um, the suburbs of Chicago, to find a facility that will be like this. So we're very excited about the opportunities um, that this facility uh, will provide um, our community. Eric, you want to hit it again? There's just some more renderings of what that would look like. So very, very, very flexible with the space and so forth. Um, and so forth. So, so, so really, just to kind of also, so some of the, the the pieces that have come up. These facilities will be owned by a nonprofit organization that has already been established. Um, there's been a board of directors that's been put together um, to own and to oversee to make sure that that these facilities um, are used uh, for the, the greater good of the community long into the the future. Um, it, I, like I mentioned, um, it's an independent board of directors. We we do meet regularly. And uh, we, the board, will be responsible for hiring the manager um, for these two facilities. Um, um, one of the things that we do show in our prospectus is that, is that we do expect that this facility will not generate the necessary income um, to, to operate um, in, the, um, in the black, if you will, or make a profit. Now, I will tell you that our projections show that this facility will only be utilized 13 weeks out of the year. Um, I, you know, as, as we go down this road, I think the greatest challenge that we have is actually going to be scheduling um, because the demand is so high for a facility like this. So, so I, I say all that to say that we've, we, we think that we've been very conservative on the revenue side. Uh, we've engaged um, the YMCA has helped us um, on the expense side along with Kevin Carr, the, 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 um, the CFO out at the college um, to put um, some, um, some cost estimates together. And with all that, uh, we think that we're looking at approximately a hundred and thirty-five to one hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year operating deficit. Now, I will tell you that the local hotel um, owners have come together and um, put together a, um, a destination fee that we're going to be charging um, visitors as they come into our community and helping to cover that. Um, with the estimates that we have, we think that we're going to generate somewhere north of around two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, which will cover that operating deficit and also put some dollars towards the marketing of, of, our, of our facility. Uh, one of the things that we have found is to, uh, to get the, 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 the tournaments to come here is that some of these we have to, we have to pay or incent them to, to, to come. Um, and, and we think that's going to be very important, especially um, um, uh, from the beginning. So, so it's going to be contract-based. Um, there will be no government-imposed tax. Um, and um, and, um, and we, we think that we've, uh, we've got um, the operating side. Yes, the destination Becky? fee, is that just charged during those 13 weeks of the year or no. all year round? We are actually collecting that now. Okay. Yeah, so, so all, all year round. I hit it again. So I've been kind of doing this. So we are currently, we, uh, so that, that uh, we, we are currently in the process of trying to purchase the north half of that lot, of that facility that you saw there um, for the Raider um, um, portion. We're currently under environmental review. We're doing a phase two that's currently being completed. We're working with the city of West Burlington on the zoning. We've already done that um, through um, um, some, some code adjustments there. Um, and, the, and we're going to be uh, beginning the, the, the subdivide, subdivision process. Uh, our building is under contract. Uh, we anticipate closing on December 15th. And, um, and we have received preliminary bids 
uh, from local contractors on that and uh, we're hoping too that once we get the building closed in mid-December we're gonna cut them loose um, so we can get that up and going um, and start marketing for uh, next next year um, so and, we, and, and currently, like I mentioned, the, uh, the project has gone from a $14 million um, um, estimated project cost to a $10 million estimated project cost. Uh, we are more than 50% there um, um, from, from a fundraising standpoint. Um, so we are, we're, we're, sitting, uh, we're sitting pretty good and um, we've got, we've got some, um, some pretty, uh, I guess, aggressive deadlines to get the, the first major phases of that campaign complete prior to year end. And then we'll be rolling it out, um, hopefully in a greater and more public way, um, here pretty soon. So the current request um, before you um, this afternoon is that we would like to transfer the remaining dollars from the Weingard contribution to this project. Um, I believe there's somewhere a little bit north of three hundred thousand dollars remaining um, that we'd like to uh, we'd like to have, so we can have that for for closing um, on. Uh, on December 15th and to start helping us with the cash flow of this uh, of this project I, I I'm sorry if I, I went through that about as quickly as I as, as I could because I know time is of the essence um, but if you have any questions I'd be happy to try to answer those Do we have a problem with that no um, one of the things could you clarify why this is going to be owned by a nonprofit but the money right now is going to the partnership could you explain what's going on there that is correct so so currently right now um, we, we've established a, a, the, uh, the corporation to, to own and operate these facilities, but we are currently working on our uh, not-for-profit status, our 501c3, I believe is the technical term, and we have not gotten all those, those appropriate designations. So as we're out raising dollars to make sure um, that those, uh, those funds um, fit, um, are, uh, um, have a tax advantage, um, um, the, the, we're, uh, we're putting everything into, uh, into the partnership. At that point in time, once we get that up and going, um, we have an agreement with the partnership to, to purchase um, that building and, and to own that. So, answer your question, Jim. We're good. All right, anything else? Thank you, Matt. All right, thank you. Good program. Mm -hmm. Good reuse of that building. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've got I've got a little information here. I'll, I don't know if this is appropriate. If I should even be up here. <laughs> yeah. There's no electric fence. That's sir. exactly right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I can't believe you just did that, Mr. Shen. I just want you to. So the resolution would transfer the it's three hundred twelve thousand one hundred fifteen dollars and sixty one cents. Um, we cut a check after approval and get that dispersed over to the partnership. And uh, just if anybody has forgotten, that's what that money was was there for. So it was, it's not like we're it was uh, taking specifically money. specifically donated for the indoor rec place. Yes. Thank you, sir. Just want to make sure we people are reminded of that. Okay, number eight, resolution approving change order number one to con to contract number seven three two nine for the new law enforcement center bid package number five HVAC heating, ventilation, and air conditioning with Brockway Mechanical and Roofing Company Inc. Chief. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Perry Hines is here with me as well from Carly Nelson in case I get kind of stumped up on some of this construction stuff. But anyway, as we started to evaluate the current heating and air conditioning system in the building, we'll even go back a little bit. In the due diligence report, it said in there we were going to have to take a real careful look at the reheat coils, the ductwork, condensing unit, controls, et cetera, et cetera. So when we put the bid together and looked at that, we were in hopes that we could reuse or repair a lot of the reheat coils and the ductwork. Well, there's no way you know that until you get into the project, tear all the ceilings out, find out that most all of this ductwork is, is fiber in nature that's kind of wrapped in like a, an aluminum foil, for lack of a better word. It's completely falling apart, holes, cracks. So as the air tries to go through the duct, it's really going nowhere because it can't get out to the return. So as we evaluated that, we looked at the reheat coils at the same time, and that basically sits inside the ductwork. It heats up as the air passes through it. That's how it heats the building. Well, most all of those coils either need to be replaced or repaired, so we evaluated a thought of repairing those. But to repair them, then we had to buy new controls. 
as, we, as we're changing the control system for the building, so it's a digital or electronic control, it's going from an old pneumatic system. The pneumatic system had air hose that ran all through the building that controlled these actuators and controls well. Those have been clipped, cut, broke, fell apart. So the air compressor just runs 24 hours a day trying to keep up with pressure to the controls. So we knew we were going to replace the controls. So as we evaluated the reheat coils, if, if the control comes with the reheat coil, why would we just try to repair it? And, and the reason the importance of this is all the ceilings are out of the building now, and now's the time, I mean, to do the duct work, to do the reheat coils. And the duct work that we think we can leave that seems to be in good repair is in hallways. We've planned this out. So in case something did happen to that duct work, we could take the ceiling tiles down and work in the hallways and not disrupt. If it goes through a room or rooms, we don't want to disrupt operations at a later date to get the problem taken care of. So that's the duct work, reheating coils. The circulation fans are either shot or going to be shot, but we're able to eliminate one of those and add three. The actuators, the actual thing that controls the vent on the outside of the building, that's working, but the device that tells it to work isn't working. So when you look through here and you see the, the duct work, the AHUs, those air handling units that I'm talking about right now, and the exhaust fans, the condensing units, those are strictly for tests. We still haven't had a chance to get in there and test those, and as soon as we test those condensing units, we'll know their serviceability, if you will. We're being told by the engineers that the air handling units that are in place will have enough capacity to take care of it, but there's only one way to test it, and that's after all the new duct work's in place, and then they can test it. But kind of the theory behind it is if it supplied enough air originally, the air volume itself should be fine for the, the building the way it is now. So we'll know that as we go down the road, and we'll know a little bit more about the condensing units. The, that's a big number, 126,000, but when we plan this facility, we plan, and I think you sent a budget sheet today that had about we still have $416,000 in contingency money. This would be obviously one of those contingencies. And so we're still well within budget. I mean, the only thing I, in the back of my mind, is not only trying to keep the project on budget, but I need a parking garage. We need to have a secure place for our guys to come and go. And this is really going to cut into that. And I understand that. But there's only one time to replace ductwork, heating, air conditioning, and the time is now. And the the aluminum stud or the steel studs are going up so the walls are starting to go up and that's why I kind of had to to get this to the forefront I mean now's the time to to get this done so I don't know if there's anything you want to add well I'd, uh, Perry with Carl and Nelson I'll, I would just like to add I'm, I'm impressed he's paying attention at all our meetings because he went through the details <laughs> pretty accurately um, so we have up here two options that we've gone through one is the worst case scenario, and one is the scenario that we've gone through with the design team, the engineers, the chief, um, and we feel that this is the best option that we have right now. It fits within our contingency, like he said. We knew that we were going to run into issues like this, so we held a heavy contingency. Um, so <clears throat> at this point, time is kind of the essence. That's why we're up here today, letting you guys review it, and once we get it approved, We'll get the contracts moving and they can start building a duct work and we can get it in and keep construction going. I was impressed too, Chief. Yeah. <laughs> Think of all the stuff you're learning here. Oh, yeah, did, you know this, did you already know this stuff? Some of it. Yeah. yeah. The difference between the two options, there's some work on the first floor that you're, the second option would take care of that you're look, not recommending doing at this point? Yeah, not in totality. I mean, there's, there is a piece of duct work on the first floor that goes through some offices that it costs about $8,500. It's not included in the 126461. However, with that said, in that number for the second floor, it's my understanding that that would also include all the duct work for the unfinished space that's not going to have a ceiling in it. So as we go along with the engineers, my thought in the back of my mind is, instead of putting all that duct work in an unfinished space that doesn't have a ceiling that we could add at any time, it would offset the cost to replace that other piece of duct work on the first floor. It would more than offset it, it's my understanding. So okay. that's kind of, it's somewhat of your answer, but there are, there are still going to be two other runs on the first floor that we think will be serviceable for years to come. And if we have a problem, like I said, they'll be in existing hallways. We did ask the question if, let's say, 
we replaced the whole thing and we went completely modern for maximum efficiency it was the, the tag was over 500,000 that that's not reasonable for us and, and I think that this is really really serviceable for a, a long time so I mean there's kind of the third option but I knew it wasn't an option but I just <laughs> throwing it out there <laughs> yeah. all right thank you Thank you. Perry, Thank while, you. while we're you. talking about this, it's not the same topic, but it's comparable. Um, we're going to have to deal with another change order likely coming up, either a change order or do some emergency work as part of this process. Uh, we There's some asbestos that's in the facility. Yeah, that's correct. It's it's an existing building built back in the 70s. Um, it, it happens as when you go through construction, if you find items that are susceptible to have asbestos in it, um, obviously we stop work. Um, make sure we're not disturbing that material so we don't get fibers in the air. We did have a company, um, Shy Battery, came out and tested tested the air, tested the materials. It is determined it does have asbestos. So um, the guys can still work around it. We just can't disturb it. We mark it that it's, it's asbestos, and we're working right now to get some pricing to get that abated. But um, I, I don't know the, the cost and the magnitude at this time. That was relatively recent here in the last week that we've got that information. So we're still working to put those numbers together. But we're working with Jim and Chief as we get just, more information. Just so, so you know, we do know another, another change order that will come along at, at some point in this project. But That's correct, yes. It won't be the same, or it shouldn't be the same cost component. <laughs> but we'll see shouldn't be. <laughs> Otherwise, that parking garage is getting smaller, right, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Perry. All right, we good? Yes. Um, we have a uh, public hearing set for uh, coming up. Number A is consideration of a sale of property locally known as 255 South Central Avenue, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. That's November 6th. B is consideration of a sale of property locally known as 251 South Central Avenue, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. November 6th. C is consideration of sale of property locally known as 506 South Gunnison Street, uh, City of Burlington, Iowa, with conditions. A fantastic property, by the way. November 6th. D is consideration of an ordinance prohibiting the construction of wells within the city limits for use of a potable water source. November 6th. E is consideration of an ordinance amending various sections of Chapter 31 Riverfront Advisory Committee of the Burlington Municipal Code. November 6th. And F's consideration of West Avenue, Mason Road, Urban Renewal Area, and Plan on November 20th. And we have some discussion items left tonight. Uh, the first one is Great Place Riverfront Selection. Chuck, come on down. So I'm here to talk to you about the Great Places grant application for the Riverfront Landing. Just a quick update before I get into that. We were awarded a boating infrastructure grant for the floating boardwalk concept to do the design for it. It's $200,000. It won't pay for the actual construction cost. There's two tiers to the boating infrastructure grant. The first tier is $200,000 for the design. The second tier is a million and a half, which is then a nationally competitive competition. But by getting all of the design done beforehand, will be much more competitive. So this floating boardwalk, and there's a some restrooms and fish cleaning stations associated with that could be a reality within the next few years if we're able to, to get some national grant funding for that. So a little bit about the Great Places program. It's a state of Iowa program that cultivates the unique and authentic qualities of Iowa communities. It provides funding for vertical infrastructure projects, which are basically projects that aren't streets, sewers, trails, stuff like that. The grant awards average $185,000. I've seen low ones for 40,000 and then high ones around 450,000, but those bigger ones are much rarer. A 50% match or a one-to-one -one match is required for projects. So when we applied to be a great place earlier, I think it was earlier this year, uh, we had to select three potential projects that we could have funded by this program. We chose uh, five projects from our, our riverfront landing vision that was done when we did the flood wall and we had a, a Facebook poll to, to see what people would want to see down there as part of a Great Places project. Uh, there were five options and the three winners was splash pad, shade structures, and amphitheater seating. We had over a thousand votes so it's a pretty good response to this and the majority of people said they wanted to see a splash pad down at the riverfront. So the, the splash pad is planned to be in front of the port. Um, it would take away more parking which 
I don't know if we're, we're prepared to do that at this point, but I do have some alternative locations. And the other options, the amphitheater seating and the shade structures, you can see where they would be. The amphitheater seating would be behind the auditorium. It would act as kind of a, a riverfront event space too, where you could hold a wedding there or some other, some musical events. Uh, shade structures, we have two cantilevered overlooks where the flood wall actually breaks and it's 100% removable panels. And these would frame that cantilevered overlook and provide some shade down there. Uh, there are a few other uh, shade structures and seating that would be scattered throughout the, the riverfront as well. So I was able to get some preliminary budget estimates for these three projects that we're eligible for funding for. And keep in mind, this includes design, which is 15% of the project, and a 20% contingency. We put a healthy contingency on this because the riverfront, um, it's mostly fill over there. You never know what you're going to get until you start digging, so costs can escalate pretty quickly. Our splash pad estimate, which inc includes the pavement, pumps, piping, lighting, drains, everything that you would need for a splash pad, is 243000 Shade structures is 120000 and then the uh, auditorium event garden or amphitheater seating is $202,500, or a total for all three projects of $565,500. So the proposed budget for if this would be applying for the grant, you have to show a one-to-one -one match. The state match you can see is 400000 for each one of these. Now I'm using this from our current flood mitigation grant. We have about 850000 of already um, committed money from the state of Iowa to do restoration. That's where we, we tore up the riverfront to put in a wall. We have to put it back. We're putting in a trail. We're putting in seat light. We're putting in seat walls, and we're putting in some new lighting. And all of those items together are about eight hundred and fifty thousand. I'm using about half of that to be conservative to make sure that all of the activities we're doing would count as a match. So that right off the bat is a pretty healthy match. Um, and then the grant request, which would be what we request from the Great Places program. I've outlined what it would be from each. I put about a 20% local match, which would be city money for each of these projects. I've talked with the, the program manager for this at Great Places, Iowa, and they've told me that if we want to be competitive, it's great to have this state money, which shows a, a very healthy commitment from the state of Iowa, but you really also need some skin in the game at the city level. And a 20% uh, match is about the lowest you can go and still be competitive. So the, for the splash pad, if we were to choose that project, the city match would be $50,000. For shade structures, it would be $25,000. And for the, the auditorium amphitheater seating, it would be $41,000. If you, you know, went crazy and wanted to do all three, we would need $165,000. That's a good term. Charlie, I have a question. That area sure. where the splash pad would go, if we didn't do that, would we be putting new concrete in there? Uh, we would need new concrete where the splash pad uh, If we didn't went. do the splash pad. If we didn't do the splash pad? Would it be an area we would, putting new, we would be putting new concrete in after this? I guess I'm wondering, uh, do we have a cost to doing that area, whether we do a splash pad or not? I, you know, the, uh, can you go to the next slide, Eric? So it, it would, the splash pad is just outside our current project area. Yeah. Okay. That shows the boundaries of where we're doing work right now. So. Mm -hmm. There, there wouldn't really be any okay, concrete torn up. Okay, I just up. was wondering if we were spending money either way, I guess, on that. I've got alternative and preferred location. The preferred location is what was chosen during the, the visioning work in the public meetings to set up our riverfront plan with the flood wall. Everything kind of to works together. Now, there is the alternative location where we wouldn't lose any parking. If we put a splash pad there, it would still work with the, the grand scheme, but there'd have to be a little bit of, of reconfiguration in the future if we did do a full build out of the riverfront area. And you go back to the, the budget slide, sorry. I highlighted the splash pad in red. I, I do recommend that we go with that just because uh, that's what everyone seemed to, to like. It's one of, one of the more impactful projects on the riverfront, I think. It's more, more active where people could use it every day. They could use it on the weekends. It would, it would be a draw. Um, what I need to apply for this grant from the council is a resolution of support. You can't give funding for it yet because you haven't had your budget session, but the resolution would say when we, when we go into our budget session, we will set aside this money for this project. 
You guys good? He needs to know what project it, you would have an interest in seeing right. this be presented. He's recommending one of the three, but he needs to know which yeah. one of the three you really want to see. Yeah. The grant application is due November 1st, so at your next meeting you'd have to decide which project or none at all. We do have a three-year period where we can keep applying for projects. We could elect to not apply for a project this year, then that, I mean, that uses up one of our eligible <laughs> years, which is an option. Splash pad came in number one as far as the survey, right? Right. Man, I can't believe that. I mean, oh, I, I guess I yeah. can, but but I that's can. that's a lot of money to keep that splash pad up. Money that's just going to keep uh, elevating. And uh, yeah, I'm not groovy on the splash pad, but the uh, auditorium event garden and the shade structures. Um, you know, I don't know where everybody else is, but I I just I guess I can tell you exactly where I am. Uh -huh. You want to go ahead? No, go ahead. But, you know, I have two and a half months left here, but <laughs> I've never been in favor of the splash pad just for what you said. The, the upkeep, the finances you're going to have to put into that thing to keep it going, it doesn't make sense to me. Something like that auditorium event garden does make sense to me because it's there. Minimal, probably, upkeep. So, to me, that makes sense. <laughs> Well, I have the opposite opinion, <laughs> and I'm not going to be here very long either, but um, I guess I feel like the community saying that they want that amenity, and the other two, I just don't think that as many people would use it as the splash pad with young families. I can see, I can see where you're coming from with that. Um, I. I know the majority of the public wants the splash pad, but I also don't think they're also thinking of the upkeep, which is unfortunate um, because things like that do require maintenance um, a lot of the time. Uh, I would use the shade structures. I find myself walking around downtown a lot, and I sometimes find there's not enough shade. But um, I don't know. It's tough because I know the splash pad would definitely be a draw for the downtown that would bring in families coming in they'd be eating and shopping and you know on days that they wouldn't normally be spending a day downtown um, so it's it's definitely a difficult decision can't be used in the winter, right? right unless you make it an ice skating rink okay, but <laughs> they do that they, how much yeah and we talked about you can rent those too though really cheap but how much are we paying? Do you know the number off the top of your head? How much? Uh, anybody? I've got a number, but I'm not sure how much it's costing us for the for the uh, fountain that we have downtown that has issues. We we looked into this. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but that fountain we have is significantly more expensive than most splash pads. The splash pad would almost certainly be less to run each year than that the fountain we we used to have that is now gone because of the flood wall. Mm -hmm. There's other communities that have had flash or splash pads that uh, they're paying for it, and right. it's and it's cost them every year, and that's you know it's not hidden information. You can people can reach out. I'm just again, I'm all for it. I'd, I'd love to have the splash pad. I dig it. I just I just think using forward thinking, um, it's going to cost money, and it's just going to keep getting more expensive as the years go on. I just think it's something people need to think about because everything else is going up, and I'm getting that from people. To say, you know, everything's going up but my wages. Well, splash pad, that's going to go up too. You know, how many people are going to use that? We've got pools, and uh, I got a splash pad at my house. It's hooked up to a hose. I splash all I want to, and I turn it off. It's a party. People can try that, but I'm just saying. I think about that one. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not for the splash pad, but I'm, I'm, I'm down for the other two. I definitely think it should move forward. But What do you think then? One or both or... If if that's what you're if that's what you're feeling, we need th we need Mayor. three. No, I'm not even. You need you need three votes on something, um, but if you're saying I, what were you in favor of? Because I've heard we've heard from four others. I was for the splash pad. So do you splash. two for the splash pad, two the seating, one for shade structures. But which one do you want them to submit? Could we do both the you, shade structures and the? I know you said we could do all three, so I'm just saying, what is what? I'm cool. To those do who two. are not in favor of the splash pad, would you be in favor of? Mayor Pro Tem, let's pull the audience here. 
No, we're not going to do that tonight. We're in a work session, too. No, we're in a, we're in a work session. We're not, we're not, this is a council meeting. So unless you're unless you're invited up beforehand, this this is a work session. So I appreciate it. Appreciate it. But we're going to keep this involved up here. Um, are you guys okay with? Uh, do you guys want to do two, or do you just want to pick one tonight to give them the okay to move forward? Because I do the two. We do have three people that say at least on the. You could. <laughs> We yeah. could have the resolution of support presented for next Monday with the two projects listed on there. You could modify it if you've had a change of mind or heart between now and then about what you want to have included on that. Um, but he can do it that way. Um, just the, the most likely funding source on this is going to be would be hotel motel tax. Um, that being said, hotel moto tax uh, last year yeah. um, came Let's in at eight seventy. Uh, we began. I didn't see what this, what August numbers look like. I know it was was sent out today, and I didn't get a chance to look at it. But uh, July's numbers were twenty. I think twenty percent down year over year after last year, being one hundred and thirty thousand overall or one hundred and twenty thousand overall down from the previous year. Um, so I'm looking at this next year being, I guess, right the current year being about 850,000 for collections. We'll see how that goes as the year goes on. We had originally budgeted 900,000 for this year, and then growing over the next few years. That means we've got more projects that we put into our CIP plan than we what we're going to have funding for already. And, and this will be something that will now be competing with those other things. I do want to stress the resolution says that you would just try to fund it during your budget cycle. You don't have to put money towards it. We can still apply with only the state money as match. If no other city applies with local money as match, then we have a chance at getting the grant. If there's other cities that put a lot of local money into it, then we're going to be out of the picture but we don't have to put any city money as a match towards these projects. The resolution is simply stating that we want to see these projects done and we will apply for them and we will try and find money during our budget session. If, if you want to be competitive on it, you need to have the match though. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's okay if we move forward that way. Just know that you're gonna, it's gonna be causing some pressure on what, what gets eliminated from the, C, the CIP plan as we go into this next budget cycle. But you'll have that resolution presented for this next time with the two Including projects the on it. the shade and the auditorium, is that what you're saying? Correct. The seating and the yeah. shade. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. You guys good? All right. Thank you, Chuck, mm -hmm. you really have been doing a good job since we stole you from wherever that place was. So, uh... College. <laughs> <laughs> you wish you were that young, buddy. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Actually, it's me that wishes I was that young, but anyway. Okay, uh, we're moving to number two, Otter Island Logging. Um, James? No. I'll give a Mr. Just brief. We have uh, Bob Petrozalka here with Geo Forestry. Uh, our staff, uh, Ryan and Patrick, especially, have uh, discussed this along with Bob uh, the option of logging Otter Island again. Uh, we did walk the island uh, with uh, Bob and his staff uh, here this spring, was it? Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, he's, we brought this forward for consideration. It's an option. Uh, if you look at the Information in the packet, we have last did this or started this in 2008, uh, working with Bob to identify the trees, and it was completed in uh, May of 2012. So I wanted Bob here to just give uh, some information on what the options are moving forward with it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, yeah, Bob Petrozalk, I'm the owner of Geode Forestry. We're consulting foresters. Uh, had our roots here in Burlington with Geode RC&D, and, &D and um, we're over, over at Swedesburg now. But we're, we're not the loggers, so we're the, the consultants that work on our clients' behalf. We represent you during the timber sale process. We, uh, just real quickly, we, we, once we secure an agreement with the client, we go out and um, develop a plan that, that will um, harvest trees in a sustainable manner. So uh, just because, for example, the last time we cut in, or had a sale in 2008, we probably could have marked or included three or four times as many trees as we did, but we just included those and, and targeted those that were uh, mature, some that were over mature, some that were dead, thinned out some stands, areas where the trees were overcrowded, we, we call out the lower quality ones and include those and give the better quality trees more time to grow. So. Um, when um, we went out this last time, I think 
the time prior to the last sale that we handled was 1981 when the city harvested trees out there. We weren't involved in that. Um, I was out of college, but, but, but not very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I'm not here to convince you to, to, to do this. Uh, I am, I would like to encourage you to practice uh, sound, sustainable forest management. If that's your goal, then Otter Island is uh, ready for another harvest. Uh, it wouldn't be as big as this last one we did for the city. Uh, it would include mostly those, we didn't cover the whole island. Uh, it would include mostly those areas where we let the trees grow, but then revisit some of those stands where we just thinned them out before and it's time, <clears throat> excuse me, for another thinning there. So. Um, how far do you take the trees down? Uh, how far do we drop them down? Yeah, I mean, there was, uh, somebody said how there was left, uh, I don't know, stumps or... Uh, or canopies, I think, too, is another issue. Um, so the stumps, you, you, I mean, you want to cut those as low as you can because you, you bid on the trees standing, not what you get out of it. So uh, we, we, we solicit sealed bids. And uh, so, you, you know, the, the logger, the firm that buys the trees, wants to take as much out of that stump as, as they can get. Now, if there's wire in it or... I don't know, whatever reason you you would cut above that, but that would uh, that would not be the norm. Um, the tops maybe. Yeah. Yeah. They're um, the the tops stay in the timber. Um, you know they can't be out in the river. Uh, have to be pulled back in. Um, but we 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 try not to move those around too much because you can do a lot of damage to the residual trees that you're leaving trying to move tops around. Um, Tops are a visual thing. It's, it's. I mean, when we were out there, it was almost hard telling we did anything just, you know, 10, almost 10 years ago. Soft maple does not have much uh, natural decay resistance, so it breaks down pretty relatively fast. Okay. Yeah, that was a comment we had from some of the Otter Island cabin owners with the tops being left. In. Yeah, yeah top, tops in any timber sale are probably the, the, the biggest, uh, um, it, detraction from the process yeah. Uh, yeah. E even if you do it properly um, it, it's I mean it's visual they do decompose and add back to the soil so but but it is a, a yeah very visual right you have an estimate if we went ahead with it <coughs> proceeds would be the same Ooh, I was afraid you're gonna ask that. <laughs> okay so the last time it was six hundred one thousand I'm uh, guessing the volume this time would be uh, it, it wouldn't be that because we're revisiting just 10 years. Um, my best estimate is it would be uh, somewhere in the 50 to 65% of that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. One of the things that I, I thought we missed last time we did this was we didn't set this money aside to deal with some of the forestry issues in town that, that we ended up with. Of course, we didn't know about the Emerald Ash at that point. I would encourage us to think about if we do this that we do something. One of the things that uh, I've talked with Eric about, I've looked at what City of Marion does. Uh, they've established a forest utility, and so they've got a set aside fund that they that they use to cover that, as opposed to where we just have it in the general fund. Um, that is something that if we were to go that route, we could look at putting that. This, this cash into that as uh, some of the funding that helps to support that operation. Now for them, the City of Marion has a separate fee that they charge on a, re they do a, a residential fee for every everyone in the community to, to build into that fund to cover the foresters. They, they've, they use that to cover their capital equipment purchases and they used it uh, when they, as they dealt with Emerald Ashbor this last year, yeah. or the last couple of years to have a fund to cover that and it's, it's not some. It's at least something that we can have a discussion about as we I go through this next budget cycle. Yeah. Throwing in a general fund, it, it gets eaten up, and then the next issue that comes yeah. along, the next tree problem that comes along, where do you get it? Where are you going to get the money for? Okay. Yes, good. I'm in, in favor of moving forward with it. Mm -hmm. If you were to move forward with this, what's the kind of process that it would that you'd be talking about? Um, I'm. If it's the process the same as we used last time, I mean, change a few dates, I'm fine with the same, uh, I forget what it's called, a 
Just our terms would be the same. Yeah. Um, so I guess as soon as I get would get the official word, we'd be entering into a contract contract for services with uh, geode forestry to market and mark and market the the property. And then what's the timing to do all that or mark the trees and then go out for bids? Um, <laughs> I guess I'd like to get started this fall. It's it's you know tough in winter getting out there. Um, we shoot for having the trees marked this fall. It's just there's that delay from once we get them marked, uh, get things tallied up, prepare the bid notices, and, and, and the potential buyers need to be able to get out there too. So mm -hmm. once we start getting some ice, it, it gets gets pretty uh, dangerous. So I, I boy, I'd, I'd hate to, to promise mm -hmm. that we'd have it done this going into winter here for you, maybe going to spring. So you may see that you have a process where you, you allow bidders to go take a look in the spring, depending on river levels too, on where mm -hmm. that goes. Yeah, that's um, the other thing, and and for the logging. In fact, I know last time we had to, we we signed a um, signed an extension because it the river can't be too high or it's over Otter Island, but it can't be too low because you have to be able to barge the logs off. And would you look at that being a one or two year cycle for for har the harvest on that? Uh, at, at, I'd give them at least two years. So you would the the fund and last year last time this was done I think the fund the six hundred thousand came in over the course of three or four different fiscal years and you'd probably be looking at least two. Yeah, you can set the payment terms up however you want. We had twenty five percent down at contract signing, twenty five percent down at uh, commencement of cutting. The third twenty five percent installment was due um, when fifty percent of the volume had been cut, and then the fourth. 25% uh, was due and 75% of the volume was harvested. You, you can set those up however you want. It's your call. You can you know say if, if the bid opening is, is March 1st, we want to check March 2nd. It's just, it, it's unattractive to the buyers when you do it that way. So to proceed, Eric would be working on getting an ag agreement developed and ready to present back to you for approval at a future meeting. <clears throat> if that's the route that you want to move forward with. I do. Yes. Looks like, yes. Yeah, looks like uh, everybody's in. Okay, good deal. Thank, Thank you, sir. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Memorial Auditorium, number three. Good evening. Uh, Casey Fleming, 3606 Memorial Park Road, Burlington. Um, thanks for having us back. Um, also, we got all sorts of folks uh, back here. Uh, that will help answer questions as they pop up. We'll go through our, our presentation here um, and do introductions at, at that point. Um, you guys have seen some of this already um, and, and have the, the obviously had the uh, entire proposal that we're uh, putting up here tonight uh, for a few days to, to look at. But uh, very similar to what uh, this same group, uh, what Stephanie and Amy presented a couple of weeks ago. A um, couple big changes. Uh, we, we've, we've worked with uh, Mike O'Neill. Uh, Mike is, is here as well uh, tonight um, uh, to work together on this. And uh, it's, it's the American Music Festival that, that, that I represent. So, so what's the American Music Festival uh, is question number one. Um, people ask me, well, is it Steamboat Days? Is it not Steamboat Days? Who gets the money? Blah, blah, blah. So the American Music Festival is a, a 501c3 uh, that's, that stands alone. Uh, separate from Steamboat Days, which we'll get into some of those details uh, as we go through the presentation here. Um, but I would like to recognize we do have American Music Festival uh, board representation here tonight and Berlin Steamboat Days uh, board representation as well as some, some representatives from some of the uh, legacy events uh, that have uh, used the auditorium over the years. So proposal specifics, uh, very similar to what uh, you folks have seen. Uh, the American Music Festival will hire employees for management of the auditorium port and depot, uh, specifically an executive director, operations technical manager, uh, which at this point we're uh, under agreement with Mike O'Neill to be in that role, uh, and then part-time labor for cleaning, maintenance, etc. Uh, we also are under the agreement with Mike O'Neill that he'll continue to use uh, existing staff that uh, know the building, have been working in the building, and uh, it'll be a real, real turnkey thing. Um, Real quick there with, with uh, the management of the auditorium, port and depot, got to uh, make sure we include all three buildings in that. So it is Port of Burlington, Burlington Memorial Auditorium, and uh, the depot. So it's, it's all three of those riverfront properties. 
And I was really excited to see all those pictures of the port and auditorium looking so good in those riverfront proposals we saw a few minutes ago. Um, you know, and a few people have asked me, well, G, G Fleming, what, what do you know about running a building? Well, I, I was involved in promoting shows there when I worked in radio for uh, about 15 years here, you know, helped promote over 50 shows down there. So uh, on the promotion side, I understand it uh, a little bit. But beyond that, I don't. Uh, but that's why we hire the right people to do it. We, we got, uh, I think we already got a great start with Mike and his existing staff uh, that do know how to run that building and, and do know how to uh, be successful at it. So. Um, Again, the board will include a seat for legacy events, civic music, and, and snowballs, so there'll be um, input from those folks as well as uh, our existing board as it stands. So uh, the city, we asked that the city will provide the American Music Festival a subsidy of 250000 annually. Uh, we're asking for a three-year initial contract. Um, we feel that length of contract is fair to uh, not only hire quality staff, but move forward with, with some successful events. and and get things going back in the right direction uh, in those buildings downtown. Uh, subsidy will cover employees, labor, marketing, office expenses, et cetera. Uh, we'll get into some of those specifics momentarily. Um, we do ask that uh, Burlington Steamboat Days and the American Music Festival would also be rent free uh, when they have events uh, down there. Asking for a one-time $35,000 donation. Uh, we are officially the American Music Festival. Um, last Friday got a stamp of approval from the state. Uh, as a 501c3, so that is in place. Uh, that's a, a 501c3 that existed in years past uh, that kind of helped with some of the finance uh, or financial management of Steamboat Days. So it was a reinstatement of a previous uh, 501c3. So we were able to get that done uh, pretty quickly. But uh, we're asking for a, a little shot in the arm to uh, add some projectors, some screens, uh, some other uh, uh, updating of the facility to uh, help make it uh, marketable. Uh, for the acts and events uh, that we're looking for. So the nuts and bolts of the uh, proposal. Uh, the city in the first column going down, the American Music Festival in the second column, and then Burlington Steamboat Days uh, in that third column on the right. Uh, so the city will go down responsibility, revenue, expenses, and then types of events. So the city would be responsible for property maintenance. Uh, they would set the ba uh, base rental rates uh, for the buildings. Uh, rental money from all legacy events. This is a little bit different than what we presented initially. 100% uh, goes back to the city for all those legacy events. Um, then we're asking that, uh, that for the events that we go out and get, uh, we take 80%. We, we give 20% back uh, to the city. And, and hopefully what would be found money uh, for the budget to knock off that subsidy, uh, which is the ultimate goal, right? We're, we're here right now. We want to see that number ratcheted down so the city has, has less buy-in and, and we have more financial success. Um, legacy events, um, Snowball, Civic Music, the list is on the next slide, which we'll get to momentarily. Um, renters can seek their own food and, and merchandise vendors. They'll be allowed to handle their own ticket sales um, as well. And uh, moving over to the American Music Festival, um, our entity, our board that will be overseeing the employees uh, that will be booking all the events, doing all the promotion, setup, teardown, technical, sound management, box office, daily cleaning, etc. We do ask that we would get 80% of the net proceeds from all non-legacy events and rentals. Uh, so again, found money, new stuff that we go out and find uh, or that we go out and market and bring into those three buildings. Um, you know, give 20% back uh, to the city. Um, we'll provide the executive director, promotions, business operator, operation and tech manager, and the part-time labor. Um, again, a lot of that is already in place. Um, we've had a handful of folks inquire about the executive director already. Haven't even advertised for it or anything, but uh, the word is kind of out. And we've had some people uh, contact us about that. But uh, uh, also then uh, type of events, non-legacy events, uh, AMF booked, uh, new events, concerts, business meetings, um, etc. Um, so then the nuts and bolts of the Steamboat Days. So how, how Steamboat Days get involved? And that's a question that I get often uh, from the public is, is, is what Steamboat Days have to do with this? Well, in our eyes, uh, when, 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 when Steamboat Days approached me to get this American Music Festival thing going a few months ago, uh, it was to help do some fundraising for Steamboat Days. Steamboat Days uh, isn't uh, as, as strong financially right now as it has been in the past. I can't speak in detail on that. I'm not on that board. Uh, but uh, 
get that fundraising arm back in place to, to get Steamboat Days going again, right? I, I use the analogy of Steamboat Days as the vehicle, and we, we're going to help put some gas in the tank to, to get Steamboat Days um, financially um, moving in that right direction that they want to move. So, so they would regain that, um, the beverage purchase and service uh, at those buildings. They currently have the port. Uh, Venue Works took the, um, the alcohol license for the auditorium, which you guys, I think, are all aware with. Uh, so Steamboat Days, with their board of 31 volunteers, would get those dollars back out of, uh, of that building. Uh, so, so that's their financial incentive. And, uh, you know, why Steamboat Days? Well, to, to me, Steamboat Days is part of Burlington. We've talked about the $1.7 million impact that Steamboat Days has uh, annually. And, uh, uh, you know, Steamboat Days, to me, is the riverfront, right? So if, if, if they can get a little bit of money back on this by providing the, the volunteer workforce that they have for decades upon decades on the riverfront for events at the port and the auditorium, uh, we think that's fair uh, to share that stuff with uh, those beverage sale profits uh, with uh, Steamboat Days. Uh, Steamboat Days, of course, currently has an office manager. Uh, they'll provide the Dram Shop insurance and, and has that uh, existing pool of servers. Uh, legacy events, a list that, uh, that was, is proposed by the city staff. Uh, auditorium events, uh, I won't read through them all unless you'd like me to. <laughs> We're good? We're good. Um, so it's all stuff that we've seen. Uh, the city responsibility and the AMF responsibilities, um, again, are broken down. Um, this is all stuff that you guys have seen before. Again, are we good? Do we need to dive into any of that? We're good. So AM, uh, the American Music Festival, uh, we, we feel that uh, in partnership uh, with our current, with our board, which we do have an, an existing board that was uh, put in place recently, um, and then working with Steamboat Days as well, um, we want to help keep that Burling Steamboat Days tradition alive. You know, 56 years um, is, is a big, big part of what Burlington is. And Steamboat Days um, is, is synonymous with Burlington, Iowa, almost like Snake Alley is or Fireball Run will be. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so the power of volunteers, right? So, so Burlington Steamboat Days has those 31 volunteers. Uh, they know how to serve beer. They've got all the experience. They got the equipment too. That's another big piece. They've got all the beer trailers already. Um, so, so no other entity has to come in and spend 30, 40 grand or more on buying beer trailers, et cetera, or renting them, et cetera. So the power of volunteers, board members with uh, a number of different skill sets and experience, uh, legal marketing, recruiting, hiring, uh, et cetera. You go right on down the line. Between the two boards, you'll have 31 on the Steamboat Days board, 21 on the American Music Festival board. Uh, so 52 board members between the two organizations that uh, come from all walks of life uh, that want to see this happen. Uh, we've had conversations with a handful of folks, like I said, about the executive director uh, position. Um, and there's letters of support from a couple of folks. Uh, ben is here tonight. Uh, Rustin is, he's over in Fairfield. Um, and, and I tell you, I've consulted him extensively. Um, Fairfield went through this nine years ago. Venue Works came in, uh, offered to run the Sondheim Center, and um, after declining revenues and declining uh, attendance, um, they ended their contract with, with Fairfield there as well. Um, at, and they've, they've resurrected it. They brought it back through the CVB, uh, through the work that uh, Russell and his team have done. Um, they went from failure, losing Venue Works, to having 100 and how many events? I don't know. It's... It's, it's, it's 160 some events all told, counting the small meetings and everything. Um, so the blueprint is there, Fairfield did it. Fairfield did it and uh, uh, they did it by going out and raising money and partnering with, uh, with everybody that was interested in seeing that succeed. So they, they've laid out a nice blueprint for us as far as how they promote and stuff, how they staff things um, and things like that. It's not exactly the same because that's a privately owned building versus a uh, publicly owned building, so um, there are differences, but still the similarities are, are there. It's been very helpful. Uh, marketing power. Steamboat Days uh, offers up an existing network of over 25,000 people on social media, an email database of 7,500 plus folks 
Um, and, and I'd argue that's, that's got to be the biggest marketing uh, database that, that any volunteer organization has that could come to the table to get out there and try to bring people into those three buildings, especially with the depot, uh, trying to do some new stuff there and really get that building going as well. And then Mike O'Neill, uh, we mentioned uh, the current operations manager. He's accepted and agreed to, to work with us as operations manager and technical director. Uh, years of experience uh, with, with those properties and in the community. Um, when we started talking about uh, all this, um, everybody that I talked to was like, okay, let's, can we work with Mike? Can we work with Mike? And I was saying the same thing. So Mike was kind enough to uh, sit down with us last week and, and we came to an agreement to work together on this together or work together on this and unite our proposals to try to make this work. So the uh, 501c3, we have been able to secure uh, donations and you can do that a little bit differently as a 501c3 as, as opposed to an LLC or a, a private entity. Um, we've got uh, three of the major media players, Titan Broadcasting, Pritchard Broadcasting, the Hawkeye, um, they're already on board uh, for financial donations uh, right out of the gate to help get things going. Uh, Danville Telecom, JNS Electronics, Drake, Har Drake Hardware and Software. Letters in your packet uh, supporting from, from all of those entities. Um, there's grant opportunities out there that uh, only uh, can be gained by 501c3s. Beth Nickel, um, Sales and Marketing Director from CBiz, who's an expert in that, uh, is, is part of our board and has agreed to take upon uh, that grant writing piece to, to help lift us up as well. Um, greater likelihood of businesses and individuals sponsoring events for a nonprofit. Uh, there are people that just want to give money for tax purposes to nonprofits, so we uh, are able to offer that and then also go out and find sponsorship income um, that can help make the auditorium and the riverfront properties um, a little bit more profitable, drive some more of that revenue, save the city and the taxpayer dollars, which is kind of the ultimate goal for you folks, right? Uh, let's keep the building going, cost you less money, and, and make us a little, but make the city and, and our community a great place for entertainment and the arts is, is kind of the big picture goal. But anyway, volunteer label also, volunteer labor available uh, as a nonprofit, which uh, overall uh, reduces expenses too. So a community buy-in is definitely needed to make this venture a success. Um, you know, we got to take ownership of these buildings as a community. Um, the history's out there. We, we could talk ad nauseum about the past, um, but we want to look forward um, into the future and how things can continue to be successful at, at those buildings. You've got letters of support from Jason Hutchison, CEO of the Greater Berlin Partnership, Becky Rump, Executive Director at SEC of their Institutional Advancement um, uh, Area, Jeff Burkhart, President of Midwest One Bank, um, and the list goes on and on talking about uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau uh, and the effect that we have on the local economy with those riverfront buildings. And again, um, a long list there, Chelsea Toll, who I think is here tonight, CVB Director, Snowball Board of Directors, Jeff Rucker, President of SEC Blackhawk Booster Club that benefits from Steamboat Days and, and serving the beer down there. So uh, it's community, 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 and, and everywhere I turn I'm getting great positive feedback. Um, again, the partnership. Is this Steamboat Days? Is this the American Music Festival? American Music Festival is the board that would oversee the riverfront buildings. We would partner with Steamboat Days on the volunteer side. We would help lift Steamboat Days up, getting those beer sales back, the alcohol sales in the building. Okay, we don't want Steamboat Days to go away. I'm not saying that it will, but I'm just saying we want Steamboat Days to be as strong as ever. And this is a way to help get their money back that they had for a decade upon decade that they lost for the last three years. Um, and AMF, we're ready to go. We got the 501c3 status. Uh, we got uh, accounting systems, QuickBooks, payroll uh, in place via the Steamboat Days model that's already out there. We got a bank account open and ready to go. Uh, E-ticketing agreement with established, established non-legacy events. And again, uh, we do have that uh, board in place of the American Music Festival. I act as the president. Uh, Chad Palmer, vice president. Um, uh, Jeff Burkhardt is the treasurer, Dana Johnson is secretary, and uh, the charter directors include the names listed there, a uh, handful of which are in, uh, in attendance tonight. Um, we'll have positions for Civic Music, the City, Burling Steamboat Days, Snowball, and again, some of those folks here tonight. Office Space already there with uh, Steamboat Days, and uh, Burling Steamboat Days already has the liquor license, just need to change it. Uh, to get that uh, auditorium building back and there's a letter in the packet from Mike Johnstone uh, and um, 
County Sheriff and Burlington Simo Days Director that supports that. So that is uh, the proposal in completion. Um, the differences financially, the big ones are we, you know, we cut the initial ask from 50 to 35, uh, give you 100% of the legacy um, revenues and, and rentals, and then we ask for an 80-20 split on the new stuff, the found money uh, that we bring in. Any other comments or no? Our job. I can go on for another half hour if you want. <laughs> I won't. But uh, questions, thoughts, feedback? Um, I do want to know how um, Burlington Seaboat Days or an American Music, Music Festival not paying any rents or anything, how that affects kind of the revenue. I know that's kind of a loaded question, but... Yeah, so the American Music Festival not paying for rental of said buildings, um, it'd, be, it, it'd still be found money, so it'd be part of that 20% subsidy that'd go back to the city. Mm -hmm. um, since we don't have any money right now, we, we'd want to get off the ground at a more affordable rate. Um, and, and Steamboat Days, uh, it, it's an ask uh, based on, you know, Steamboat Days isn't financially stable as it has been in the past, and it'd be a way for them to, to keep moving forward uh, fiscally uh, just in a little bit stronger way. Mm -hmm. How much do, does uh, Steamboat Days? Yeah, we were about 11,000, 10.5. Last year, yeah. the current years was that a little bit less than that because you asked for it to be more in the 8,500 level. So I'm Amy Burkhart, 2633 Cliffwood Drive. And uh, last year we came before you and asked for a reduction in our rents, and you agreed upon a reduction that brought our level of rent to $8,000. So that's what we paid. Our contract is actually due now, and we've been waiting to negotiate that pending, obviously, this agreement. Um, so right. we're ready to come again with this, that contract. This yeah. term in the contract, this is the first time that we've seen it too. It wasn't part of what we was initially proposed. It mm -hmm. came back in the, the version that was brought to us at the end of last week. Um, the, I think it was in the initial proposal, but it wasn't in the contract. It wasn't in the contract. It was in the initial proposal. And the, uh, the, the 35,000 is something that got added to the contract, which is part of the proposal. But the we hadn't been talking about the 8,500 when we we're talking internally, but that is something that is certainly under the purview of how you want to deal with this. One of the other things to think about as you're talking about this, uh, providing alcohol rights to uh, Burlington Steamboat Days, you know, if we look at, I, I don't know what that's going to amount to for revenues for them. Uh, I mean, it takes an awful lot of effort to do it, so there's, there's reason to have it, but um, venue works their net out of that was 40, between 40 and 50,000. I'm not sure how much over 40,000, but their net over cost of goods sold was about 40,000 that they, they made out of that. So that's something that is going, that you're giving the rights to steamboat days with this contract. So this contract is providing a significant amount of support for steamboat days itself if as it's presented along with what what you're doing for management of the facility. So just make sure that you understand what's being asked for within this proposal. Some, uh, this is a rough draft on a, a contract. Uh, our attorneys gave a brief look at it and they didn't have time to truly have, do more than just give a couple of rough comments back. Uh, they may have other things that they will counter and say need to be included or have recommended for changes. One specifically, liability on uh, alcohol services provided down there. Even though it's Steamboat Days that's doing it, we're asking someone to monitor them for us. And so somehow that needs to be discussed in this contract. And I just don't know how or what that wording would be. But um, On the $250,000, uh, where'd that number come from? Based on PAL, you want to speak to that well, in it's, detail? It's number two in their PAL. Yeah, it's based on past financials um, on where the operations have, um, what the operations have cost the city in the past. Um, that does not include um, utilities. Um, we, utilities is, you know, I know Mike had talked about including them, you know, being in the building and, and controlling the thermostat, which, you know, I think that's something that, that does make sense. Um, we didn't alter uh, that uh, in, in our proposal like um, but
but it's based on past, past financials on operations cost, uh, which includes um, salaries, marketing, upkeep, etc. I don't know if you want to speak to greater. Yeah, and there's a in your packet towards the back is a hard estimated budget of exactly what those fees come out to be. But the uh, the lion's share of it is 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 salaries for local folks. So you you guys don't want the beer license, is that right? A AMF? AMF does not know. So then you're asking for 250 from the city and 70 for the utilities, but then you're giving away the the money for the beer, the 40. Partnering, thousand. absolutely, based on the fact that they're going to do it, um, as opposed to another entity coming in wanting to do it that would, unless they have the volunteer force that's all licensed and prepared to do it, uh, that that's the big hill to climb on on the on the beer sales is, is running it, the work. Mm -hmm. So Steamboat Days comes to us, AMF, and says, first of all, they've done it forever, right, up until the last three years. So they've got the capable volunteer force, they'll hold the dram shop, uh, they've got the equipment, the know-how, and the manpower, so it makes sense for them to get that revenue. Which, again, it's, it, that's not asking for anything new, that's something that they had up until Venue Works. But when Venue Works had it, they used that money to help pay expenses. Is that right? Where you're yeah. just giving it away. So just speaking on behalf of Burlington Steamboat Days, since I'm not on the AMF board, but I am the president of Burlington Steamboat Days, you know, that is, again, part of this piece of supporting a 56-year tradition in our community that does provide a significant economic impact to our, our community. And kind of similarly to how we've addressed that there are needs for specific skill sets to make these buildings a go, you know, the alcohol concession is also a skill set that our vo volunteers have. Um, we have the equipment, we have the training, um, we are all trained to mitigate risk, which would be for ourselves and the city. Um, looking for people who have been overserved, we've had very, very very few, if any, problems um, with the events that we do currently host, and that's kind of what our Sheriff Mike Johnstone's letter references. So, you know, we believe it's in the best interest of these buildings' renters to have trained people come forth that can handle that very specific skill set and, and portion of what they expect from the venue that they're renting from. So that's kind of where Burlington Steamboat Days brings that to the table. And as far as the revenues, you know, we really looked very closely at this because um, we really wanted to have an understanding what really is it you know that we're making from this and is it worth it you know is it worth it to to do this because our volunteers are taxed year round to do these these events and so um, we needed to answer back to them and you know when you quote the uh, venue works number jim from our review of the venue works p and l it looks like their food and beverage income was about 68 Takeoff cost of goods sold is 25. They had bar supplies of another 3,700. So we see a net number of 39,690. That's before any staffing because we have no way of knowing out of their part time labor pool what to break out for that. And before any um, maintenance on equipment or insurance or the rental of equipment. Um, which again, Steamboat Days already owns all of that equipment and a number of organizations locally have it. So, you know, I, I, I would venture to guess that net number is probably more like 20,000. If we look at what Steamboat Days was doing before Venue Works was in the building, and you know, we were bringing in about $40,000 as our net number, but a lot of our expenses were already netted out to the event. So our dram shop and expenses like that were covered in the Burlington Steamboat Days budget before these other events. So if we had to take that off of that 40,000 number, I bet we get right about to that same thing. So yes, you are helping provide a source of income for Burlington Steamboat Days, but it's not this huge significant pool, I guess, that's gonna make a, a big difference, especially not if we're looking at it on an 80-20 split. So Stephanie or Jim, what are we spending utilities per year at the auditorium? the last couple of years 70. it's but I've budgeted 70 but it's more like 56 I think or you've got the numbers yeah, 68 at the auditorium well that's what I have it budgeted for but that's an in significant increase and that's kind of a guess on what the alliant rate increase is going to be and I don't know where that's going to put that number um, is it fair to say then that more events means higher utility costs that fair? It will, but that structure is, I mean, the base cost is really, you don't, you're not going to see a tremendous amount of variation depending, I mean, just to keep that building uh, yeah. 
at the right temperature is probably keeps that being from there being a large variation in what that cost is. Yeah. So but yeah, it, it will go up and down from, based on usage. Yeah, from 2011 to 2016, the the utilities uh, expense ranged from um, you know 87,000 to uh, 54. And I'm kind of wondering when I look when at the variation that there there has to be something else that's in there besides yeah. actual facility usage because it didn't change what that much. It, I don't know if there's a timing of a bill or what happened, happen. but there's been a change that yeah, occurred yeah. somewhere in there. And then it went to 62. The gas and then 64, it 74. Oh, okay. But that's yeah. that yeah, Seminole 54 in 2015. doesn't have that large of an impact. It did help to bring the cost um, down, but not that much. 17 and 68. On a different topic, are we done? Can I ask a different question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, did I see in the contract something about naming rights? going to be with you is that correct that would be something we put on the table if the city was agreeable to it naming you know, the memorial auditorium maybe well say the the main floor or the oh. banquet room or say it's the henderson main floor at burlington yeah. auditorium you know something like that i guess my question how can you do that with on a three-year contract are you just you, you just do it for a three-year contract oh. for example the i wireless center in, in the quad cities is now the tax layer center yeah. Uh, those those are unless it's a large private gift that is sizable enough to warrant a forever yeah. naming uh, it's usually a three to five year deal so if we were able to sell some naming rights again part of that revenue would be found money that'd be shared with the city so how, how active would you be in trying to do that uh, very <laughs> again with city approval um, but it's rare to see a building um, city owned privately owned uh, to not have have names and logos plastered all over it that's that's part of kind of the way things are matter of fact i saw i was watching um i don't know a college football game the other day and they're they're even naming the back white paint on end zones now um so yeah that we think that's a potential revenue source for the city and obviously so you're, for you're us as well about 80, 20 there too, then, correct i would believe that's kind of that'd be found money that'd be all new revenue mm -hmm. that wouldn't be um any uh, legacy ma uh, money, so that'd be all part of, of the shared dollars. Uh -huh. Jim, looking at this proposal, relative to what our expenses were prior to Venue Works, how do you see this playing out in comparison to us? Um, I don't have any of those sheets with me, but okay. the the years right before venue works we were understaffed actually probably close to the staffing level that you're showing here with two full-time this is this is a lower staffing level than what we if we were operating ourselves what we would put on this i don't know how that plays out um but this is one position less than what we would be looking at and i i think that when we did that part of that was there's a lot of time that gets involved to take care of three different facilities and hopefully this works that you're presenting a proposal with two full-time trying to do this and you're able to keep all three um, done to the extent that will be necessary um, our costs were netting in the 320 to 330 330,000 range this proposal and I again I'm not looking at it but I think it's in 380 390 um, but when I was looking at that, there's also a loss. Now, if you do this agreement, I was not counting losing uh, revenue from Steamboat Days rental. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another change in, in the structure too. However, if you compare it to us running it ourselves now with our current cost structure with three full-time staff, that's a net cost of uh, just right around 400,000. So this, is, this comes in well below it. And, I mean, is is they presented a number what they look at for what their their expectations are for where this would go over the course of three years. Is your net was a net three seventy the first year? I can't remember we when we did that. Three ninety, yeah, then three seventy, then three fifty, somewhere in that neighborhood for what their expectations are for increases and in, um, being able to use of 
have use of facility occur. Right, and that's the big difference is we, we plan on increasing the revenue sites considerably. And unlike three city employees, which I think would do a great job, uh, we, we want to bring somebody in that will bring in new shows and get more aggressive, such as the naming rights, and really grow the revenue. And ultimately, as Casey said, get off the take from the city and make this building stand alone. And, and I think I emailed you. Uh, we want this to be wildly successful because in three years we're going to need firefighters. Uh, you know, how are we going to pay for that? Well, guys, <laughs> come come through for us. You know, if we're going to do this, so, that's just the way I look at it. Uh, having been, you know, kind of knowing what has gone on with the Capitol Theater and everything, and having had big expectations there too, a positive. Uh, what happens if you? don't have posit what happens if this doesn't work and what if there's more cost and you can't pay it then do you come back to the city for more money what if you what if the money you have and the and the you know the event you have don't pay the bills what what are you going to do then it's a fair question we have to make it work we just have to make it work we've got to bring in the right right team and, and get aggressive and but I mean, what if you end up the year with a negative number? Do you come back to the city then? Well, based how, on the, how, what what would you do if you had a loss? What would you do? So the way it has been done elsewhere with with the model that we're looking at is you you build all that in before you have an event. So if if you have the right sponsorship and annual support from your folks whoever that may be, business members, uh, trusts, et cetera, um, you, you go in with a break-even mentality where, and I know it, it sounds a very, very good, uh, but, but the way it's being done elsewhere is but a, a show is paid for before it happens. Mm -hmm. So they've got enough sponsorship dollars to cover the cost, the base cost. Um, and then if, if nobody shows up, nobody buys any beer, um, there's no money made, but there's still no money lost because all those, the, the previous dollars were already put in to pay for the dance troupe or the country band or, or whatever. So the, the way that the, the model they're using in, in, in the other municipality is they raise and they have X amount of money. That's how much they can spend to go out and bring stuff in. And again, they're, they're doing that based on assuming that they can cover their costs with the sponsorship and the funding they get from municipalities and or private entities. Um, and then anything that's made above and beyond that is, is then profit. Um, if I put my promoter hat on a little bit, that building seats roughly 2,000 people. When we promoted shows, we, didn't, we never, ever, ever, ever thought about 2,000 people. We only thought about between 900 and 1,200. Um, and, and we had to get to that number before we even knew that we could promote it because we weren't in the money losing business as most people aren't. Um, so, so that's how we were successful with that. We'd, we'd garner enough support before we booked the act to know that we only needed to sell 900 tickets to get past that. Um, but, um, uh, but do you know the difference will be that you'll have to bring in more events and keep asking for more sponsorships? Yeah. And yeah. And that's and that's what, where the that's dice the that's catch. where the dice are rolled. Yep. Because if I'm a sponsor and no one shows up, you're going to have a hard time getting me to sponsor the next one. Right. Well, or if you ask the same sponsor over and over again, I mean, they're not going to do every single event. And yeah, and, and I think that's what I said to Jeff. You got to have some. You have to have a huge variety because you can't keep trying to focus on the same group of people right. for every event. That's right. Well, I'm sure you, I'm not telling you anything. You don't. Right. Know. It's yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> you're right, Jim. Uh, it's a great question, Becky. We have to make sure that we don't lose money. And we've got to be smart, and we can't be as risky as we'd like to be because we, we, we don't have the money to lose. Yeah. So that's a, that's a fair question. Well, I think it's easy to put together a pro forma, but to make it work, it's the, a lot of work. The expenditures that you've submitted in there, is that your anticipated full expenditures? It, it, No, okay. 
there are more expenses that we, we will have if we're successful promoting new new acts and more acts. And what we found out was uh, we don't turn the spigot on and have acts show up January 1st. It's going to take time and get to get on their calendar um, six months, nine months, maybe 18 months to get some of the things we want. So uh, as we're successful in getting them in, we will have more expenses. That's what you're asking. And then we use the, the expenses from Venue Works for the last year. And just to point out order, the actual utilities on Venue Works P and L for the the year was sixty eight eight fifty five. Okay. To um, touch on that a little bit too, is there, there's two different ways you can book a building if if you're a promoter or an event organizer. Uh, they, the I think the terminology in the in that industry is either the uh, the four wall model or the, or the revenue model. Um, some places you go and you, you say, hey, I want to have an event at your building. What's the cost? Some places that cost includes sound, light, security, cleanup, and everything. Um, in, in our building, it doesn't. So in theory, when it works right, you pass all that expense on to whoever's putting the show on. Exactly. All right. So. In, in, at some point, if we could get to a point where we could give somebody a flat number of it, if you want to come in and do a show here, it costs this, and you build all your expenses into it. Um, that number is going to be a lot higher than just renting the building. You just want to rent the building, have a party in there, and hire a, a DJ or somebody to play guitar and sing. Uh, that's a lot different than trying to put on a civic music event or a concert where you're trying to put 2,000 people in there. So. Um, a lot of the expense moving forward um, is going to be tied to who wants to come in and do events there. Um, we don't have the money. The city doesn't have the money. Our expenses are based on those that are shared, the hard expenses of keeping the building open and keeping it staffed. The expenses beyond that, which is why, and I know it's a little bit kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but I don't think we're going to be a lot, we're not going to be out spending a bunch of money to book shows. You know, we're going to be reaching out to other people that that's what they do. There's there's thousands of promoters out there that that's what they want to do. They're trying to sell you shows to get them in your building and make money for X amount, um, which Capitol Theater, I mean, that's that's an example. Um, you know, the Washington, there's people coming through all the time. So one of the questions is, how come Venue Works that wasn't successful? How come they didn't get shows in here and, and fill the place up? Um, they're doing it in a tumwa. They've chosen to do it in Atumwa. They've got two pretty sizable shows in Atumwa that are going to sell out. I don't know why they didn't pitch those shows to Burlington, or maybe they did, and I don't know. But um, it's working in Atumwa. If they can work in Atumwa, it can work here. I mean, I was part of, again, over 50 shows in 10 years down there, and we only lost, or didn't break even, well, okay, lost money, on maybe 10 of them. Not to make money on every single one of them, but if you can on the majority, um, I think we can be successful. I guess the main thing, the con, you have your, your base budget, which covers the majority of your fixed costs, and that, that is what the subsidy is based to cover. Correct. Um, you're going to have flexible costs that you're going to, your ability to, to successfully do will be based on your ability to have successful events. Right. But your base costs you have covered with the subsidy. Yeah. And that, that is one of the differences between the capital. It doesn't guarantee that they're going to, it's going to turn a profit, but at least they, the, the subsidy is what's getting them to a yes. position where they can. But still, the subsidy is a set dollar amount. Yep. Yeah, and by contract. So then they don't, they can't come back. And that's what, it. that's the yep. point I'm trying to make is, is that it for the city? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And no I mean, what and, it, and that's there. part of, if you look, that's where, if this is your true fixed costs, your base costs, they should be in that position where they have the ability to ratchet back some of the other promotional things that they do if they're not having a rent rentals come in to justify it. Yeah, that's exactly right. We got to the two fifty by taking last year's expenses off and then we took seventy for the utilities, another seventy for the overhead and HVAC and uh, operating um, expenses and that left us at the two fifty, which should cover the anticipated expenses. And I guess I, you know the reason I'm asking is because of the citizens that they I want to be sure that this that the expenses that we are budgeting that will be it there won't be any surprises um, 
The surprises that we'll still have is if the HVAC system goes out well, yeah. or something comparable to that. And that HVAC is one that we do have a major concern on. Um, and I don't know what the cost on that will be if and when it happens, but it will be a high number. Probably not that much different than what Doug talked about for um, the PD building. Well, the utilities would be unknown, and then I think it says we pay for, like, the toilet paper and all that stuff in there. So the more it gets, the, the higher that will be. But, yeah, we should make money on the events then to cover that. But the HVAC, even if, if we have a contract or no contract, it's, it's still us. Yeah, ha it's, it's happened. Yeah, that's a wash. And one important thing to point out was the way we have this structure with the 80-20 revenue sharing, it is in our best interest <clears> to <throat> book these acts and grow the revenue. We benefit and we're able to grow the remission. Uh, so that, that's and, and I believe that. I'm just saying yeah, what sure. if it doesn't work out that's that fair way, question. I guess. You know. Any other questions? So the 20%, every time you have something in there that makes money, right? We're talking about net, we're talking about, not talking about gross. Let's say you make $100,000, so we get 20. <clears throat> so now our subsidy is down to 230, in other words. It, I mean, well, I mean, it, 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 net, yeah. it offsets part of our yeah. cost. Yeah. 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 And that's all how you want to move the money. Yeah. I mean, we're, we don't have the contract worded that you net the payment against it. Right. Well, I don't mean that. I mean, you're offsetting. Is what but I mean. in right. the bottom line of it all, yes. Bottom line is always yeah, yeah. what we're looking at here. And that's if, if the subsidy is this mm -hmm. and we can, you know, ratchet that down as the years go by, um, every year that goes by where that subsidy is less, that's a win for the city. And it's also a win for our citizens in the region because when the subsidy goes down, uh, that's costing the city less money and that means people are down there having fun spending money. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I can tell you, people will drive and come to town to that building. Um, they, they will come from the Quad Cities for the right show. They will come from Peoria. Um, there, there's data out there that will support that. Um, but it's got to be the right show. I mean, sh booking shows, it's all about cost, routing, and the market. And, and if, if so, shows are selling in Atumwa, Iowa, they'll sell in Burlington. I think so. I believe. I think Mike would agree. Absolutely. Anything else? I guess my only issue uh, is the utilities and then the one-time donation. Um, you know, I can I can be okay with uh, Steamboat Days not um, paying rent. I guess. Uh, I'm just kind of curious. You know, where everyone else sits with those two or those three items, or if you're good with everything as presented. I'm, I can't say I'm good. I'm feeling better. I'm definitely feeling better about it. Um, I, I like the uh, right on. I like the fact that you guys bagged O'Neill. Um, I thought that was. Uh, well, I, I thought. Bagged it. Uh, whatever word you want to use. Um, but um, he's Mr. Concert. Uh, you know, I, I feel, you know. I feel so much better about this because I know that you guys are you guys are all about it. You guys are committed to make sure this thing happens. It's not people that are just swooping in, flying in and flying out. And that's what makes you feel a lot better. What doesn't make me feel good about it is I was hoping to get that price, not the initial price, but the $250,000 price. I was hoping to get that down a little bit lower. I, I think it would make the citizens feel a little bit better moving forward because we did try this project once with, with uh, Venue Works. I don't believe that you guys are going to be venue works. I don't. Um, I'm hoping, man, I'm sure hoping that you guys can even come close to, uh, to what you're trying to do here. But, um, yeah, I am having a hard time choking on that $250,000 plus utilities. I am. I got to I gotta give that to you. the beer or the but, steamboat days around, too. But I look at it this way. If not them, then, well, exactly. what do you do with the building? You got it. To me, it's okay. We've got a dedicated group here, of enthusiastic people who are willing to get the community involved. I can give them a three-year chance, but if it if it doesn't work, then what are you going to do? You're going to tear the building down. You're going to close. You're going to shut it. What are you going to do? So you guys got to make this work. I'm putting it on you guys. <laughs> Tell them again, Jim. If you want that building, if the community wants that building, you got to make it work. 
And I think that's how I feel too. You know, give them a chance, but if you guys can't make it work, then I don't know right. who could make it work. You know, I think we have so I many of our local have... people working on this. I mean, that's what gets me Let's do it. Let's make it happen. So everyone's okay with as is. Uh, I, I think we're at that spot. Where yeah, and and I and the questions I bring up is just because I want those answered up front. Um, sure. So that people won't say we didn't ask those sure. questions. Sure. Sure. And you know, I, you can't speculate, but man, think about it. Oh, yeah. You know, I, don't, I, don't even the, wanna, I don't even want to go there right now, Casey. Just, just think stop. about the numbers. Do some math of if it does work. You know, when, and, and think about the. the when the, it the, works. Not when it works. When. Sounds like a salesman now. <laughs> got when it some, works. Somebody's got to sell it, and that's what that building needs. Is yeah. somebody <laughs> That's where, you know, yeah, I think and, you and, and, and you know, and, and, and you know, high tide raises all ships. And the more stuff we have that auditorium, the more stuff that's going to be drawn to the Capitol Theater. You know, the more people are going to be coming to our hotels, spending that hotel motel tax, keeping that thing afloat. Good spending Lord, man. Who's your dad? Right? Bob Fleming. Somebody no. get this guy. Somebody <laughs> get this guy. Thank you for your time and good questions. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Folks. Thank you. All right. Oh, okay. But we still have some negotiation to do on contract, correct? Some phone Yeah. Some things up. Okay. Uh, number four, neighborhood cleanup project. What's that? Mr. Jensen? Just wanted to talk. Briefly, last year we did a, a fall cleanup down along the riverfront where we had some uh, dumpsters and one day able to bring in some trash or items throughout your yard or house that weren't able to get rid of through the spring cleanup or just through the normal trash setup. Um, we're looking to do that again this year, but bring it out into the neighborhoods. Um, we've talked to uh, a couple churches. Uh, Grace United Methodist and Oak Street Baptist will be willing to allow this to have uh, dumpsters on their site uh, and have it on Wednesday, October 25th from 10 to 6 p.m. where people could bring uh, items normally uh, that they're able to set out for trash, not including appliances, batteries, tires, demo material, electronics, TVs, computers. Uh, similar to last year's program, I uh, wanted to I guess, bring this board to council, see if this is something still want to do similar to last year but expand it into the neighborhoods and if you have any questions or ideas as well I think it's a great program I think it's wonderful I've already too. got things I'm starting to bag up <laughs> I can't do it physically right now but in my head I am so so we use some of the remaining funds from our community clean up to cover the cost of uh, bringing this to the landfill and then uh, right on. minimal cost working with the uh, uh, Floyd's uh, that we worked with last year for the hauling of the dumpsters out there. So, Very good. so we'll be doing. I guess if there aren't any questions or support for this. We'll be doing uh, some promotion for this uh, again Wednesday, October 25th, 10 to 6 p.m. Uh, at the Grace United Methodist Church on Angular and Oak Street Baptist Church on uh, Oak Street, uh, where there'll be dumpsters. People can bring their items. They will have to be show residency from the City of Burlington, either through an ID or their uh, current waterworks bill. And again, will not accept items uh, normally not accepted uh, with your trash set out, uh, such as appliances, TVs, electronics. Uh, it's something where the individual does have to load these into the dumpster themselves. Uh, we will have some staff there and other volunteers, but it's Sweet. up to the individual to set them out. Uh, and our only job, I guess, as volunteers would be to check that they're residents of Burlington, that they're not depositing these non accepted materials. Excellent. We good? Yes. Good. I like it. All right. Me too. Um, anybody have any problems with uh, appointments? No. Okay. You guys have been phenomenal. Uh, Mr. Tesla, any closing remarks? <laughs> Boss Lady, any closing remarks? Uh, Saturday is City Day in the Park, right? Yep. Yeah. City Day in the Park. Do you want to? One, one to four at Danker Park uh, Pool. Uh, have a lot of events. Different departments will have uh, tables uh, showcasing what they do with the departments, as well as uh, city vehicles, some bounce houses, uh, some 
goodies and treats and different events going on there from one to four Saturday at uh, Dankwart Park Pool area. So we encourage everyone, it's a free event, to uh, come out, learn about the city, and uh, have some fun. We've got a new mayor's game this year. I'm not going to tell anybody what it is. You'll have to come out and find out for yourself. It's a lot of fun. So there's that. Anything else? That's, that's all I got. Okay. Nothing right now. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem? You going to talk about the leaf pickup? No, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Bishop? Nothing other than please vote tomorrow. Oh, yes. My gosh. That's, that's right. Voting. That's right. Uh, make sure you get out and get that done, uh, City Manager. Radio? Who's doing radio? Oh, yes. Um, AP Park tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday. Oh, yes. <laughs> tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's who's in for Wednesday KBR? Nothing here. So I could have to deal with me and. No, I'm just here a short time. I don't think I should be. I will maybe make some adjustments. I had some plans, but I can try to change let me, that. Let me know what's up. Otherwise, for sure, <laughs> for sure, I'll I'll be there. He has, he has a top in the flesh. He can talk about something. And oh, the yeah. flesh, my friend. Guess what? Yeah. So. You can take your cardboard cutout with you. He can be two places at once, though, if he doesn't. Uh, I don't normally do this, but Stephanie, go ahead and mute that real quick. <laughs> City manager. Uh, Chief, did you have some? Yeah, I did have a few things. If you got just a few more minutes, I know it's been a long night, busy night, but. I kind of put together a, a quick list just in light. I know that you've asked before about recruitment efforts. I wanted to talk, give you a little update on that and, Sweet. and uh, community outreach efforts. I know that's been discussed lately, and, and uh, I thought we were putting the word out there, but maybe we need to put it out there a little better. So just briefly, I kind of try to put a list together. This isn't all inclusive, but it's the best that I could come up with today. But as far as our recruiting efforts in middle school, high school, and college, we do career fair days in all those locations to promote the department, not only for the department ourselves, but just law enforcement in general, the sheriff's office, the Burlington Police Department. Uh, the uh, PD Explorer Post through the Boy Scouts, it's a very active program. We have several explorers now that are participating in the program. They get together, together about once a month down at the police department. So again, to promote the the department, our internship, college internship program at Western Illinois and Southeastern Iowa Community College. Uh, we've established a minority recruitment committee. Uh, and it didn't seem like at first we were having a lot of success, and then I look back and start putting it all together, and it's been really, really successful. I mean, we've hired three minority full-time officers, and since then, as a matter of fact, our uh, female minority officer today for the reserves got certified through the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy. So. Really exciting, super exciting. That's been the process. Uh, meetings with the NAACP to discuss opportunities and recruiting minorities to test. And with that, through the recruitment process, we partner with workforce development. And anybody that's struggling with the test, the written portion of the test, we've been able to put together a program and establish a way that they can go out there to improve their skills to help them pass those tests versus just showing up to take it without a clue as to what's going to be on it. That's not fair to anybody. So we're working on that. Uh, different presentation to our neighborhood groups and church groups to increase awareness and gain feedback on the, the issues that face us with our, our minority recruitment issues. I mean, and what can we do to improve those to get feedback? And I talked a little about community college, but through the criminal justice, we have a curriculum director out there that we've partnered with. We actually have some of our detectives that will go out there and teach on a very, very limited basis when they have time to go teach them the classes to get some interaction with the students that are there as well. Uh, some brochures we put together and actually distributed those through different parts of the community. Uh, the last three years, and as a matter of fact, this is going to happen again tomorrow, and we're going to have people at the NAACP Justice and Disparity Summit in Ankeny. We have did that the last three years, and again, like I said, we'll have officers at that again tomorrow to try to figure out what can we do better and, and what's out there that we don't know that we can learn and bring back to the department and participating in Juneteenth and Martin Luther King Jr. celebrations uh, to help foster those transparencies. Uh, this summer, for the first time, we hosted a Youth Police Academy, August 7th and 8th. And I'm sure there was a night drive in 
paper about that where we got students together from all over the district and actually put together a youth academy and those of you that have went through our citizens academy it was very similar to that we just couldn't take it on for 10 or 12 weeks at a time but you know it was, it was quite the effort for the grade school kids to get out there and see that now we do have a job shadowing program for high school and college students so, <coughs> and then and to kind of sew this all up in 2016 we went to an event that was hosted by the NAACP at the library and the president at the time specifically asked me about a, a biased policing policy and when I went back and really looked at it, 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 it we talked about that in our mission statement and our core values but we didn't respect the policy and I thought that that was really important so in November we did establish that policy and put that policy into place in November of 2016 so I thought that was important that, that I brought that up. I talked it a little bit last year at the banquet. Uh, so let's talk about community engagement just briefly. Uh, our Shop with a Cop program, our Citizens Academy, we're very active in all our neighborhood watch programs, Red Ribbon Week, Safe Trick or Treat, which is coming up. That's sponsored by the police department. I think we're up to 17 or 18 tables again this year that's very well attended. Our after school programming, Safety Town, uh, daily school visits, we talked about that, we're in the schools every day. Our Special Olympics and the efforts we're doing there, POP unit, you know, we went out and got that grant for $250,000 to make that possible, and, and it, it seems to be a real success for us. Uh, the 4th of July barbecue celebration, high school health fairs, grade school career fairs, bridges out of poverty. The department's not only been trained in that, but we're very active in that. We actually have officers and command officers that are now donating their time for the program. So, I mean, that's fantastic. That's been a really, really beneficial program for the departments. Uh, reading programs, uh, block parties, uh, the sur surge neighborhood revitalization. I've been part of that for almost four years now as we try to revitalize some of those neighborhoods. The Safe Families program, it's, it's still in, a, in its beginning stages, but we made a lot of progress. It's a, actually a program that came out of where we can train local families if we have some people in need that don't have a place to stay. This kind of all came out of Kadari's case where we actually had kids and we then did a survey at the school and we had a lot of kids that didn't have a place to stay. And so what do we do, you know? So we're putting together the Safe Families program so we can have a family maybe take somebody in and give them a place to stay for a night or two so they're not out on the streets. Uh, Des Moines County Living Well, United Way, very active there. Burlington Little League. And then, just briefly, some of the, the training subjects. I know that that's been talked about here recently, but this is an example. Uh, ethical decision-making, this is training that the department's received. Fair and impartial policing, civil rights in the 21st century policing, Iowa diversification, population, racial profiling beyond the black and white, ethical leadership in law enforcement, safeguarding privacy, civil rights, and liberties, race, the power of illusion, looking at race relations, white like me, Department of Justice, Religion, Cultures, and Communities, unbiased, <clears throat> implicit bias, decision making, and civil rights, crisis management, anti bias training, community policing strategies, de escalation skills, uh, harassment, and racial profiling. So, to kind of sum that all up, I mean, culturally, we're working really, really hard at the department, and we have worked really hard at the department. And I was fortunate enough to get to attend the NAAC bank last year, and it was a surprise to me. I don't think too many people, if anybody knows this, because it's just a, a personality kind of a thing, but the award was in my name, but it probably should have been in the police department's name. And it said it uh, presented for your commitment to making Burlington a safer place to live, your openness to listening to citizens of the community, encouraging staff to learn, participate in diversity training, and interact with groups it forms, demonstrating a strong willingness to improve race relations in the city of Burlington. And that was signed by President Frederick Say of the NAACP. The NAACP. So that was kind of what brought it all together for us. And, and again, we'll, we'll continue those efforts every day. You know, I want the whole community to understand that, that, that we do reach out and that we are involved in this community, and we will continue those efforts. So thanks for your time. I appreciate Thank it. You, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fire Marshal, uh, you had something? Thank you. I just wanted 
to let the council know that the six new firefighters hired under the safer grant started today mm -hmm. um, I wasn't in the fire station a whole lot today but it sounds like we've got a really good group of guys I know there was a lot thrown at them today um, they're going to be doing it uh, one week they're going to be working uh, eight to five this entire week um, today was full of uh, paperwork uh, getting all their equipment laid out for them and then they're going to be uh, doing some specialized training the rest of this week before they actually start their start their shifts uh, first part of next week so um, we're very very proud very pleased that the council moved forward with this this really helps our department out a great deal so I want to thank you also wanted to real quickly uh, just remind everybody that this is fire prevention week uh, we were out in school today uh, doing fire drills, uh, starting with them anyway. And then um, again, we did our poster contest uh, with the fourth grade classes in all of the elementary schools. Um, Bickles Bi uh, Cycling and Fitness has donated a bicycle as a grand prize winner again this year, and the Art Center has uh, judged our posters for us again. The uh, first place winners are all going to be on display down at the Art Center. Um, new we're going to try this year so um, people will be able to see those first place uh, posters as they walk down Jefferson Street so anyway I just wanted to brief the council on those two items and uh, remember to check your smoke detector and you have, <laughs> you have you. Uh, firefighter testing pardon me you have firefighter testing yes uh, with this hiring we've pretty much exhausted the list and we're going to try and, and get another list um, uh, we've actually since then we've got another opening so um, we're going to try and get another list for which to hire from yes okay good mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I just want to remind. Oh, are you still going? Yeah, I got a long list, man. Oh, do your thing, man. Do your uh, thing. Fall leaf pickup. Mr. Fitting didn't want to speak, so I guess I will. Uh, <laughs> six week session uh, that starts next Monday. Uh, so the next six weeks we'll be doing fall leaf pickup. Uh, Monday would be Friday's route. Uh, would pick up on Monday and just sort of rotate through the week. If your garbage is on Monday, then you'd pick, have a pickup on Tuesday. Um, this is uh, your busy time of the year, um, so this is uh, something that uh, Mr. Fitting gets stressed over in the first of the year, this and then uh, clean up in the spring that he just frets over how is he going to make staffing work, which is a significant issue. Um, and just a reminder, Thursday at 4 o'clock is a special meeting, combined meeting with the planning, 4.30, uh, combined meeting with planning commission. Um, and that was it for today. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody to uh, make sure they get out and vote. Let your voice be heard. Um, if you don't, um, well, I guess it's not going to stop you from complaining later because it doesn't. But um, uh, you got to get out and vote. I had uh, somebody also asked me. They said, "Well, it seemed like I wasn't saying any, I didn't have any statements to make about what's going on in our city." Clarify the day that I got back in town. I released a statement to the Hawkeye, and um, it didn't go out. It was a mis it was a mistake, and I write Tanner Cole. Uh, so, um, but I, I did want to say you know, that we're not oblivious to uh, to what's happening in our community. Uh, we know what's going on, and uh, I've talked with uh, everybody that I could possibly talk to in all conversations. All ended up back with. That we're going to try to handle this the way that we'd want it treated, or that we'd want it handled, um, with respect and and the right way. So, a lot of moving parts, and I know everybody has different different needs where they want, whether it's information or whatever. But we're trying to do this the right way. We're trying to do this the right way. So, um, again, my, my statement that I would make tonight is is that uh, everybody's trying to do this the right way, and uh, as information comes out, it's going to be released to the public. Um, and that uh, um, that we want to be respectful to uh, to everybody involved. Um, so uh, that's where we are right now. Um, it's not a it's not a fun time uh, to even have to say this, but uh, that's the reality of it. And we have to. Uh, we're going to deal with this as a community, and we're going to move forward as a community. So uh, just be patient, and uh, just know that we're all uh, we're all working toward the same goal to make sure that this is handled the right way, the way that it should be handled, the way that we'd want it done. If it was my kid or. Uh, if I was, uh, if my son was one of the officers, so I'll leave it at that. Is there anything else that? Uh... Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience.